Thanks, Sean. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got asked a very interesting question at uh, at lunchtime, and uh, for for those in the room who know me reasonably well, they know that uh, I have slight introversion uh, tendencies and sometimes not so slight misanthropic tendencies as well. Um, but I did get asked how well I'm coping uh, being at the symposium, being around lots of people and people coming in and talking to me. Uh, and I found that I've coped very, very well because I'm around a very good, uh, good group of people, lots of, uh, lots of good friends, lots of like minds, lots of very interesting people. So this event, which would normally be a big stressor for me, hasn't been as big a stressor as it uh, but perhaps might have otherwise been. Uh, and it really highlights to me, the substance of what uh, our next speaker, Dallas Hartwig, is going to address is that the people around you have a very, very big impact uh, on your mood and your stress level. So uh, I'll thank you for not stressing me up, first and foremost, um, and then we'll allow Dallas to tell you why that is. Dallas Hartwig. So something is wrong, um, other than the fact that I don't have a presentation. Something is wrong, and we all kind of know that. And we're here, we've been talking about the way we mistreat the environment, the way we mistreat our bodies with poor nutrition, the way we exercise incorrectly, or we don't exercise and are sedentary. We've talked about the way we mistreat our animals, in fact, we're farming. There's lots of different things that are wrong in the world that we're all here to be like, hmm, what do we do about that? I'll go one step further and say, even if we fixed all those things, even if we said, yes, I have my nutrition dialed in, I sleep enough, I have uh, you know, good amounts of physical activity, my uh, micronutrient status is good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we commonly hear discussed in the ancestral health community, there's still a little something niggling, there's still a little something that is wrong. And to me, that something that is wrong is uh, a modern example of yet another evolutionary mismatch, where what we expect from a social and um, evolutionary perspective is that we have a very uh, moderately sized, supportive, interactive tribe that in the modern world we've largely forgotten how to do. So my hypothesis then is that the something that is wrong, in addition to all the other things that are already wrong, is that we have been disconnected historically over the last several hundred years as the world has changed, as it's become more industrialized, as it's become more busy and fragmented, um, that we've been disconnected from that tribe. And I use the word tribe because that's something that makes really good sense if we're stepping back into the primitive world. We've seen pictures over the course of the weekend of um, mostly naked cavemen squatting on the ground and rocks and we tribe is like kind of makes sense there we've talked about apes and tribe kind of makes sense there um, I think it's a good word I think the thing that I would kind of rework that into is maybe say village because I think a lot of us in the modern world can more closely identify with uh, living in a small medieval village where we have buildings and homes and structure and businesses and interactivity and village I think makes good sense so that village comes along with a relatively small amount of people that you know reasonably well, you know their idiosyncrasies, you know their pluses and minuses, you know the ones to steer away from you because you can't trust them, you know the ones that are really good friends and they have you back no matter what. And um, that village idea is something that I'm seeing more and more in the literature, I'm seeing more and more sort of pop science books uh, written about, and I think that that's a, a good indicator that we all know that there is something wrong with the way we are um, building and maintaining our social networks. And I don't mean social networks as in social media, as in Facebook and Twitter. I mean social networks as in people that you know and you know their idiosyncrasies and their pros and cons and you know their stories. They're the people that you would have lived with for your entire life. You know their parents, their parents know your parents, and we have this actual network here. We have this actual web. And when I think about a social network, when I think about connectedness, in my mind I envision this uh, spider web where there are lots of different nodes of contact. And that is a very portable idea because it's in our minds, it's perception. And that perception, that story, that feeling of rootedness or connectedness is something that we can take anywhere we go, which is why I can go on vacation away from my family and away from my friends and still have that deep sense of embeddedness and connectedness with the place I came from, with the people I care about and the people who care about me. 
And that is a really powerful modulator or balancer or stabilizer of our perception of stress as modern humans. Because in the crazy fast paced modern world that we have with uh, low nutrient inflammatory food choices and chronic sleep restriction and circadian rhythm disruption, and environmental toxicity and disconnection from the earth, et cetera, et cetera, we um, get this chronic stress response. And this chronic stress response, as you know, um, really kind of centers around the HPA axis where you have a central perception of stress that then peripherally tells your brain like, hey, some, or tells your system something's wrong, we need to secrete stress hormones. Um, cortisol is obviously well discussed in this community and you know that like that stress response um, over the course of time, when it recurs, when it becomes chronic, causes all sorts of metabolic and neurological and GI dysfunctions. And basically throws a whole wrench in the system it's my working hypothesis that having that deep and meaningful embedded sense that that social connectedness is a way to kind of interrupt and alter that perception of stress at the brain, at the hypothalamic level. And there's some really cool research on this. I'm less interested in the really, the research part of it and the more the social experience part of it. So my presentation, one of the reasons I don't have a PowerPoint is because I'm more interested in having a little more of an interactive experience, a little bit like Daryl does with some of his primal play but a little more here where I'm like, let's have a conversation, let's engage with each other, let's look each other in the eye and have this interaction because that piece really is what being human is all about. And um, when you frame it through the evolutionary mismatch, yes, there are lots of things we need to kind of go back and do differently or reframe in the modern world. And I think one of the things that we need to reframe is the value of that close, intimate, proximate social communication that really only happens in a meaningful way when you are face-to-face. -face. It does not happen on the telephone or via Skype or via Twitter or Facebook or text message. And to me, and this is just the way I think about it, I think that you can develop those relationships face-to-face -face and maintain them online, maintain them through technology as a poor substitute, as a temporary substitute until you get together with those people that you really care about again but you can't really develop those from scratch online via these technological media. And like this, to me, that's just a good way to kind of say, okay, what's the difference between a face-to-face -face interaction with somebody you really care about that you can then stay in touch with when you're somewhere else versus how I met somebody online and we had this great text message communication, but I don't really know what they smell like after they haven't showered for two days because we've never gone traveling together. And like those are the things like and there's again communication wise those are the types of things that you learn about people on a very subconscious hormonal neurological level when you know them intimately and you spend a bunch of time with them that's not the like i can think about what they smell like although sometimes you can um, <laughs> but it's it's all of these very subtle influences that happen as part of our nonverbal communication right so we say social we typically think about talking I'm using more broadly and saying the interactions that take place between two people when they're physically proximate. That's social to me. Now, companies, corporations, I say names, companies like Facebook call the thing they do social, right? It's a social network. But it's not really a social network because there isn't that nonverbal, meaningful human interaction that takes place there. It's a mediated interaction. That's what we call a media, right? And so it's a mediated interaction whereby it's the, the information that's being uh, transmitted is compressed and kind of put into these neat little packages where it's stripped away of so much meaning that we would get in actual face-to-face -face communication. So this whole process started for me, and I should credit Jamie and Anastasia um, to a large degree for sort of pinging me on this a bunch of years ago and saying like, hey, you need to be doing more with this because it's actually a piece that I, I don't hear enough people talking about. And they kind of planted a seed in my mind and then I had another experience um, when I was traveling. Uh, I was in Berlin. Uh, I was in, in Europe just on a vacation. And I was in the middle of a trip and said, well, I should get a haircut. And I was in a tiny little neighborhood in Berlin and sat down to get a haircut and waited my turn in line. And there was 10 or so of us waiting there. And I looked around and nobody was on their phone. They were reading the newspaper or just talking to the stranger next to them or just kind of hanging out waiting. And for those of you who live in North America or have spent enough time in North America to observe North Americans' habits with handheld electronics, that was a really shocking thing. Because in North America, it would have been nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 people who had their smartphone out and they were Facebooking or tweeting or whatever. And that was a like, well, this is weird. Why, why is this? What's going on here that's so different? And it's not the technology component. It's not the 
uh, availability of you know handheld electronics. It's not the connectivity. They have all the same things in mainland Europe that we have in North America, and obviously here as well. But so what's different? What's driving that behavioral difference? So it got, kind of got me thinking about that and got me diving more into the what happens with social interactions, what motivates those interactions, and kind of what do we get from that? So the title of my talk then is Friends and Lovers, How Other People Modulate Your Stress Response. I'm gonna kind of just pass over that in a really convenient way and try to get into a little more of an interactive discussion piece because what I would really like to understand and to kind of start a conversation on is why is it that we feel like something's missing? And why do we self-medicate with stimulating electronic media? What are we looking for? Where are we going? And what's missing in parts of our lives where we look for that? Why do we tell ourselves stories that text messaging and Skyping with people is just the same? Because, well, we have people who view the world as the same, the same way we do, and we're just keeping in touch with real people anyway, so what's the difference if it's text message versus sitting down and having coffee? I think those are largely stories we tell ourselves because we justify our behaviors because we're so busy and we're not, we don't live in the same place. But ultimately that doesn't ring true with me. That doesn't sound like, that doesn't resonate as the real story. So um, thinking, about, thinking about this idea of social isolation, this idea of loneliness. And I use the word loneliness as kind of a, you know, kind of a common word and in talking to people about this idea that something is wrong, what I hear them say is, I'm really busy, I don't really have time to connect with the people that are really close and meaningful for me, to me, um, and I, I have this sort of like little hole over here that I kind of fill with other sort of types of stimuli and other behaviors. And to me, I'll just loosely call that loneliness as the opposite of that web of connectedness, that embeddedness, that home, that that uh, sense of family and that you have your people. I use on social media, incidentally, I use the phrase your people or my people, capital M, capital P, to be like, yeah, they're my tribe. And there's a little bit of irony in that because I'm talking about it online. <laughs> but that concept of having that, um, that deep embedded is something that seems to be decreasing in our modern society over time. And the, the research on that is quite clear where social isolation, which is a little bit different, um, is a really strong correlate with uh, anxiety, with depression, with suicide risk, with uh, all sorts of different types of uh, chronic disease processes. And I think that part of that is because of the absence of that stabilizing effect of a legitimate social community makes our stress response system more likely to be hyper-reactive and over the course of time, that stress piece then contributes to that chronic disease risk more over time. Does that make sense? That's kind of how I view that. I don't have a, a, any research to say like this is the direct, this is connected, this is connected to this, but that's how I'm thinking about things. So that um, embeddedness then would be rooted, would be connected, would be I have a place that's mine, I have some people that are mine, and loneliness then would be I'm a little bit adrift. And people say to me fairly often, uh, I kind of feel like I'm just kind of out there I'm a little bit, and they don't usually wor use the word adrift, and they definitely don't use the word loneliness, because loneliness is a little bit like the word depression or anxiety. Most people don't really like to say I'm depressed, although over the last uh, couple of decades with pharmaceutical, um, I guess I'll say marketing, depression has been a thing like it's okay to say because lots of people have it, so it's all right now. But not too many people will say I'm really lonely. And I'm really lonely I think is a really powerful kind of cry for help, but it's really what you're saying is I don't have a tribe, I don't have a social network that makes me feel really supported and connected, and that's what's wrong. So the disease risk, the, um, quality, the, the effect on mental health, those things I think we all sort of intuitively go, oh yeah, like I get that, like I see how that's the case. And if you look at things like uh, Blue Zones, some of that data, some of the data on um, longevity, which I don't think is the best metric to look at in terms of quality of life, but there's a lot of overlap there. A lot of the Blue Zones information looks at people that live a really, really long time have these robust social networks and they're, they have that supported, rooted, embedded feeling that can even, they can even take with them if they physically relocate because it is a concept, not necessarily I live across the street from somebody that I've known for my whole life. So there is some portability there, but it's this very kind of, this, it's this sense that Yes, I have, I have some people. 
the conversation that also takes place often when I, when I have this when I have this kind of idea exchange with people is, okay, we live in this very big global world. We move around a lot. We move away from our families. Uh, a lot of my closest friends live in different states and different countries. How do we deal with that? Isn't interacting technologically better than nothing? And I think it is better than nothing, but I think it only is better than nothing in the in the situation or in the context when we know people intimately, we know their secrets, we know their lights and their darknesses, and we know the things that make them human. The thing that's interesting about, about the internet and about sort of the, the smorgasbord of topics we can pick from there, and we can also pick from a smorgasbord of people, by the way, if you've ever been on an online dating site, there really is just this like endless well of people to choose from. And I think that we self-select communities and populations that have that see the world the same way as we do. We're like, yeah, okay. You like mountain biking and you like really good coffee and you care about ancestral health, we should be friends and Jamie and I are friends because we have those things in common. <laughs> but I think that we may get into situations sometimes where we don't have to engage with people meaningfully and sort through our differences. And we see this a ton. Being Canadian, living in the US and observing American politics is really interesting for a bunch of reasons, <laughs> one of which is that we, we find people just sort of like hanging out with people that they identify their political viewpoints, and there's not really a lot of productive dialogue on why do you think what you think and like, let's talk about it. There is, I'm red, you're blue, we can't really be friends. And um, I think that's also true on a larger scale with online interactions where we, really are good about talking about things we like, that we're excited about, that we're interested in. We're not as good about having friendly and productive dialogue and, and dispute resolution or conflict resolution really sucks online. Because people who disagree online usually come out with like all their guns blazing and they go nuclear in somebody um, instead of, hey, I see it a little bit different way and here's why. And that's a kind of an interesting thing to me. And I think that that maybe is a little bit of evidence that the type of interactions that we have online, um, that we do, we say things that we would never sit down across the table and say to somebody. We, you would never come to my house at dinner and say some of the things that people say on the internet in a public forum. Like I think it's amazing and terrifying the way people do that. So I think that there are differences in the way that we interact online that actually are, are really large pieces of evidence that it's just not the same thing. So then the question is, well, what do we do about that? How do we, you know, where do we go from there? And in developing this concept of a tribe, of a people, of a village, uh, I, think, I think it's important to consider they don't have to all view the world the same way you do. We have this um, really amazing tribe and village here where we have a lot of overlap in the way we view the world. We definitely have some differences, but this is a really sort of comfortable, easy place where we self-selected to come and be like, yeah, we got all this, we're motivated, we got all this, um, you know, similar worldview, but I think it's also important to be able to kind of go back into our worlds uh, wherever we live and engage with those worlds, the people that are physically proximate to us, and engage with them in a way that is constructive, um, but also accepting of the way the way things are in their world. So we have this kind of thing because if you're in a you know a medieval village uh, of 200 people. Like, you know people's idiosyncrasies, you know the butcher that will always cheat you if you don't pay attention when he's weighing the meat he's selling you. And we know the person um, who, uh, you know, always skips out on church, and we know the woman who will sleep with anyone in town, and we know the magician who is just playing a thief. And like, we know all these, like, good and bad things about people, and we just sort of say, yeah, you're part of my village. Like, okay, I'm cool with that, because we all have family members who are just like that, right? And those were people that we may not like their behaviors, we may not find them to be kind of constructive and, and, and healthy and good influences on us, but they're part of who we are and where we came from. So in talking, going back a little bit to the, uh, the way the social world influences our stress response, um, that can either, the, the social interactions, that embeddedness can either dampen or exacerbate that stress response. And, uh, when I say stress response, we're talking about activation of the HPA axis. You have a neurological and a hormonal component there, and there's lots of overlap and interplay. Something that I think is interesting um, when looking at connections with disease, or so I, I, I do a lot of work with nutrition have um, for many years, and the interplay between uh, nutrition choices, 
uh, systemic and chronic inflammatory processes and chronic disease is kind of this, you know, fairly, fairly well connected system. My idea now is really that you can moderate a lot of the relationship between stress and dietary choices with enriching social interactions. And we talk a lot about the French paradox or the Spanish paradox, and we look at the French who drink red wine and smoke like chimneys and eat bread and cheese, and somehow it seems to be totally okay. And I think a good chunk of that um, is probably explained by the way they interact socially, especially interacting over food, because we look at what their food choices are and we can't figure out how they don't die at 40 years old of a heart attack. And I think a lot of it goes back to the positive, stabilizing, dampening influence of the way um, those social interactions take place. So those are things that we can very easily glean and take with us, right? We can very easily take some of those ideas and say, okay, I'm gonna live my life a little bit differently. I'm not going to eat in the car. I'm not gonna grab it and run. I'm gonna maybe not eat by myself as much. Um, and what I do when I go to a restaurant with friends is I kind of just tell the waiter like ahead of time, like, we're gonna be here for a while. Don't try to turn the table over in an hour because we're not leaving. And some of those kind of things that are um, really easy things to do sort of free you up and give you permission to, to do things a little bit differently in the way that you engage with people. One of the other things I think is interesting, and I'll use the analogy of processed food as a kind of comparison with the way we use uh, electronic media, in the context of an evolutionary mismatch model where uh, things that are new are a little bit suspicious, they don't necessarily mean they are bad and harmful, but they're more likely to be so. So things that we've invented and stuck into our modern life that didn't exist uh, several thousand or a couple million years ago are things that are more likely to be problematic. So we invented processed food, stuff that is uh, um, either inflammatory or simply low nutrient and displaces more nourishing things. I think that the way we interact with uh, electronic media is really quite similar, where it's something that we've invented. It's very, very stimulating. We, it feels really good and all you have to do is look around um, at the way people select towards that behavior to, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that we do it because it feels good um, and we can tell ourselves lots of stories about why we do it, but really it's because it feels good. We have that, that loop of self-stimulation and there's a concern that either that self, that self-medication, that self-stimulation itself is a problem, but there's also the piece that sometimes we use that to justify not really getting together with people because getting together with people is a little bit messy. And, you know, in younger generations, I look at the average age here, you look at people who are um, now in high school and college and in their 20s, and that generation having lived in a very different world than those of us in their 30s and 40s and 50s, um, the way they engage with their peers is dramatically different and they'll often uh, select into, yeah, I'm gonna choose to text somebody instead of taking a phone call. And actually, even myself, I'm no sort of these, I actually like taking phone calls less than I used to. Anyone else in that same boat? They're like, yeah, don't call me, just, just shoot me a text, yeah. right? And one of the reasons for that, or at least one of the hypotheses for the reason for that is that it removes some of the messy, so the messy human component of vulnerability and unpredictability. So if you shoot me a text, I can take as long as I want to respond. I can craft my answer and I can edit it before I send it. Um, whereas if you give me a phone, you give me a call and you ask me if we want to go to dinner on Saturday and I don't know if I do, or I'm still trying to figure out which plans I want, it's a little harder to do on the fly. And so we sort of take a step back and we try to corral things. And we try to make things more neatly packaged and, and um, less vulnerable ultimately. But I think it's that vulnerability and that intimate knowledge of people's idiosyncrasies and their joys and failures and the things they tell you that are not true or the things they tell you that are true. That piece is really what lets us know that we do actually know somebody else, someone else, which is part of that tribe. You can't really have that sensation of embeddedness and connectedness within your tribe unless you actually know people and what you learn from people on their Facebook page is not actually knowing them. So, the other thing is that when we look at uh, the way people behave with their handheld electronics, with their portable electronics, is we find that they'll often, um, lost my train of thought. Um, we'll find that they'll, they'll often use those things as a, uh, as a way to put in place or a way to kind of distract themselves from what I'll just say is their real life. So I see, I see people being super duper busy and I'm like, well, why are you so busy? What's going on? I'm like, oh, I'm just like, all these things going on. 
And that's often the reason why people say they don't have enough meaningful interaction with their friends and peers and families. They're like, well, I'm just so busy and everyone else is so busy too. And I think that's, that's very multifaceted where there's a certain, especially in North America, but in sort of consumerist capitalist cultures everywhere to a certain extent, um, being busy, being productive is a little bit of a fetish. And we sort of glorify being so busy. I got all these things going on and so important and I have all these hobbies and I have this job and I work so hard. And I think that's part of the problem. But I think the, another part of the problem that we maybe don't address as well is um, we tell ourselves we're busy because then we don't have to engage with other people. And we can be busy and be distracted and self-medicate with these very stimulating devices and then we can text message somebody and say, yeah, I'll keep in touch with my mom via text. And it doesn't really work that well. So we kind of are prone to telling ourselves some lies along the way with how busy we really are and whether that is displacing some really nourishing, meaningful human interactions. And so those are the kind of questions that I encourage everyone to ask themselves. Those are the questions that I ask myself. I will credit friends of mine last night who gave me a hard time because at a social gathering, I had my phone out and they were like, ha, you're talking about what tomorrow? And I was like, Yes, you're totally right. But we all do this thing and we all struggle with this thing. And I think that's um, something that we can share. I think that's something that we can learn from each other on. A question I have, and I'd like to just like feedback on this, in the way that you interact with your smartphone, how many of you have developed parameters in the way you use that? Schedules, apps you've taken off, uh, notifications you don't get anymore, ringers and silent like things that are turned off how many of you have developed parameters where, like this is what i need to do to make my life sane well isn't that a kicker we're all in this thing together because we all struggle with the schedule connectedness loneliness media stimulation sort of complex the thing that i haven't figured out an answer to and this is something that again i'd like our community to start thinking about and talking about more is um Engaging with that system, with that, uh, I don't know what to call it, social media complex, and be like the equivalent of the military industrial complex thought of social media. Um, in engaging with that by purchasing a phone and by getting a plan and being mobile and being connected on Wi-Fi and having email and having all these social media platforms, almost by definition, the very first step we take there is engaging with a corporate interest that wants us to feel like we always have to be available and we're always connected. And the hive brain at Google or Apple knows more about the way our brains work and pulling us in and keeping us looped into that so that just like with the food scientists who know the salt, sugar, fat, and multiple masses stuff, um, just like the food scientists who know how to ping our brains and make them happy so that we continue to eat the processed food on and on and on, um, I think they also happens with the with the uh, technology, with the media use, where we're engaging in a bit of a tug of war that we probably can't actually win. We might be able to establish those parameters and figure out how to contain it, but I think in starting that process and taking those first few steps, we have started in a bit of a slippery slope, and I don't really have a good, clear answer on what we do about that. I think the parameters are something that are really super important. But I think it's also good to be able to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and say, well, what's actually going on here? Why do all of us have to establish parameters the way we use these devices? Because they're so ubiquitous and pervasive and because they sort of worm their way into, and in some cases really take over our lives in a damaging and unhealthy way. Um, I think pulling back the veil and saying, okay, yes, one of those reasons is that corporate interests want us to be connected all the time and that's not good for us and we have to just be able to call it by its name and recognize that disparity or that that discrepancy does that make sense i'm not a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory guy but the sheer way that these kind of corporate interests make money goes on data collection when i actually use my device goes on selling me the actual hardware and by selling me the service to maintain connectivity well, that all depends on me needing to be online all the time. And if I'm not connected, if I don't really care about social media, if I disconnect, if I kill my Facebook page, and if I'm only available by telephone, it's a landline, none of those things make money. And so I think we have to view those systems, that complex with a great degree of suspicion, just like the way we view food scientists, 
food science and invention of new foods that, again, by definition, aren't necessarily harmful to our health, but that very much can become so either if they become super normally stimulating, just like the, the processed refined foods, or if they displace more nourishing, meaningful interactions. And I think there's a good likelihood that both of those things occur um, with, with the media, uh, with the media use. One of the other things that I, that I kind of think is interesting in being one of the reasons why we continue to stay looped into that system is we have this um, thing that we do called image crafting online. We basically show people what we want to show people and it's really super awesome. And you've seen people's Instagram feeds and Facebook, Facebook pages, they're like, their life's pretty awesome. And if you look at Facebook use, I forget who mentioned it um, in a previous presentation. If you look at Facebook use, I think it was Rob, um, yeah, you look at Facebook use, the more you're on Facebook, the less, the more prone you are to depression. And I think part of that is what we all, what uh, we all do as humans, which is compare ourselves to somebody else. And if somebody else gets the luxury and the privilege of putting out a story that's not representative of, re of reality, what we're comparing ourselves to is something that isn't real or go, we're going to be unhappy with that comparison because we always look um, our life that we experience always looks pretty poor and mean and empty and, and not as much fun, not as rich and not as glamorous as that. So, so what's our solution? We create our own Facebook page that looks just as good, maybe even a little bit better. And we all posture and we're all inauthentic. No, of course not. Um, but I think, again, being aware that those things take place and those influences are, are, um, are happening allows me to look at someone else's Instagram feed or Facebook page and go, well, like, that's cool, but like, I wonder what they did the day before when they weren't you know, riding a motorcycle in New Zealand like I was yesterday, right? And so remembering that what you see online is not really what goes on in people's lives allows you to say, okay, cool, we all have the same struggles. We all struggle with coming up with parameters. We all are in this thing together. And in engaging with people in our physical proximity, whether or not they view the world through an ancestral health lens, whether or not they have similar values, I think it's a really, really important thing to, um, to kind of implement in our lives, to have constructive dialogue, to take ideas that we have that we think will make the world a better place and to plant them as seeds in somebody else's mind. And maybe that is not fertile ground. And maybe you end up just sort of agreeing to disagree. Uh, Canada just had a federal election recently. My cousin, who's very politically vocal, sent me a meme that said um, Thanksgiving, because it was just Canadian Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, uh, a chance to talk to your family about not voting for Harper. It might ruin Thanksgiving, but it might just save Canada. And so that, which thankfully it did. Um, but the, dis the discussion really goes back to, it's okay to disagree on things. It's okay to kind of knock heads. And I think that's how you distill things down, where you come up with better ideas going forward. And there's been so much amazing stuff shared this weekend that I'm super stoked to go back and talk to people about. Um, and take that social network that's not just the people I know here, it's not people I know elsewhere, but the people that I could or should know in my local environment and to engage with them in a really productive way um, so that we have that physical, local bond, that embeddedness, that connection um, that really has powerful effects on our, on our health overall not just disease prevention, but also mental health, happiness, and all sorts of other markers. That's what I intend to do. I hope you will do something similar. And I'd love to see more of this discussion um, online, ironically enough, um, <laughs> since I don't get the chance to have coffee with most of you on a regular basis. Thank you.